Okay, so we're going to look at just basic combinations. We're going to look at permutations, combinations, and the counting principle today. They should, this should all be a review from what you um, have had in Algebra 1, 2, and Algebra 3, 4. Um, with the exception of things might get a little bit more difficult or a little bit trickier. So it's important for you to keep track of things that you get confused on, which is why I suggest in your homework you highlight things or circle in red so you can go back and review and study those specific questions. If you didn't have an issue to begin with, you probably won't have an issue, you know, the second time around. So um, those you can kind of gloss over as you're studying. So uh, look at example one. That would be my brother. <laughs> look at example one. Um, they said that you've got eight pieces of paper that are numbered one through eight and they're placed in a box. One piece of paper is drawn from the box, its number is written down, and the piece of paper is replaced, that's important, back in the box. The fact that it's replaced back in the box makes this an independent event. From the second drawing. As soon as I replace that back in the box, when I go to draw the second piece of paper out and look at that number, the same numbers are still in the box as they were for the first drawing. So the probability of selecting one through eight is identical in the first drawing versus the second drawing. If we were to not replace that, I pull out a number and set it aside and don't replace it, now when I go to draw out the second number, that second drawing is affected by whatever I drew out from that first one because now there's one letter, one number fewer in the box. And in addition to that, it makes a difference as to what number was drawn out of that box. So when we don't have replacement, those are dependent events. When we um, have replacement, it's independent events. So we're going to look at with replacement first because that's what they said. Um, and then we want to see, when the numbers are added together, how many possibilities are there for a total of 12 to be obtained. So let's look at our draws. So we've got first and then second draw. So let's just go through the numbers one through eight. If I drew out the number one for my first number and put it back in the box, would I be able to draw out a second number to add to 12? What's the highest number I could draw out? An 8. And that's not 1 and 8 is going to add to 9. That's not going to add to 12. So, all right, so if I drew out a 2 for my first drawing, 2 plus what is 12? 10. Is there a 10 in the box? Nope. What about 3? 3 plus what is 12? 9. Is there going to be a 9 in the box? Nope. What about... Um, what did you say, four? What about four? Yeah, four, and I'm going to put the four back in the box. Is there an eight to draw out? Yes. So four and an eight are possibilities that I could draw out that add to 12. <coughs> then I, the next number I could draw out is a five. Five plus what is 12? Seven. Is there going to be a seven in the box? Yep, for the second drawing. And then I could draw out a six. I put the six back in the box. What do I need to draw out to get 12? Another 6. Is there going to be a 6 in that box? Yes, because I replaced it. Remember, there's only one 6, but I replace it back in, so I have the ability to draw a 6 out again. And then a lot of you will stop there and go, well, 7, we already drew a 7 in the second drawing. But I can draw a 7 in the first drawing. My very first number could come out to be a 7 then that means that my second drawing would be a five and those are two different outcomes. A five and a seven is different than a seven and a five. And so are there any that I'm missing? An eight and a four. So I could have drawn from my first number an eight and then my second number would be a four. So how many total possibilities are, are there? So there are five possible ways or possibilities. So how, how does this affect it without replacement? So we're going to have the same first draw and second draw. We're going to look at the same numbers that we came up with before because they all still add to 12. 4 and 8, 5 and 7, 6 and 6, 
7 and 5, and 8 and 4. If I draw the number, record it, and then set that number aside and don't put it back in the box, are there any of these particular possible ways to add up to 12 that are no longer possible? Why the 6 and the 6? Yeah, because the 6 is going to be sitting outside the box. There's no way you can reach in and draw another 6 because you did not put it back in the box. So this is not possible. So what that means is, instead of five ways, we have four possible combinations or ways. So without replacement tends to lower our possible outcomes. Tends to. Any questions on replacement versus non-replacement? Okay. So then let's look at the fundamental counting principle. So we've listed out here the steps to using the counting principle. And so you should remember from back in Algebra 1-2 or Algebra 3-4, typically we use the counting principle for choices. And what this says is, is find, the, find the number of events happening. An event is a choice. So you're getting ready to go to lunch soon, correct? You know, a lot of you, that's all you can think about is lunch. I've worked at this school for, I don't know, 13 years, this particular school. I have never once set foot in your cafeteria to actually eat there, nor, nor have I eaten there because it's a little scary thought for me. You have like green hamburgers and weird chicken sandwiches that I don't know what's in that chicken sandwich, but it may not be chicken, who knows? If you never thought about that possibility, I'd be concerned. Um, but let's just say that you're getting the normal standard lunch for the day and they've given you some choices you get two choices for a drink four choices for your entree don't choose the green hamburger you get two choices for a dessert I know you probably don't get a dessert but that would be the exciting part of the lunch for me and then um, thank you to Michelle Obama you get um, two choices for your vegetable right did you know that that's why you get two veggies yeah that is why um, so, the counting principle, you're going to take each of those choices and you're going to multiply them together. So you got two choices for your drink, so two, times four choices for your entree, eight, times, what did I say for your dessert? Three. three or two? I don't know, we'll go with three, that's more, that's happier. So eight times three is now 24, times two veggies, 48. You have 48 different lunch possibilities. So if you went in there 48 different days and that's all they offered was those same things, you'd get 48 different lunches. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> you may not like all 48 choices, but you get 48 different possibilities. Same thing happens. Hopefully you got dressed this morning. Since everybody's wearing clothing, then that's a good thing. But hopefully you weren't wearing that to bed. <laughs> but you get, hopefully you chose to wear a shirt. You chose to wear pants and you chose shoes and perhaps, let's say, socks. Couldn't you have a very, you know, you could have 10 choices for your shirt, three choices for your pants, um, maybe two choices for your socks. I hope you have more than two pairs of socks. And then if you're a girl, you could have 50 choices for shoes. And you just multiply all those together and give you however many different outfits. So that's typically what you use the counting principle for in the past. Um, and that's still the same here. If you have any choices, you're going to multiply each of those choices together. That's assuming you have one selection from each of those choices. Everything changes if I got to choose two desserts or to wear two shirts. And then it kind of changes things up a bit. Let's look at example two. It's a different use of the counting principle. This one says, in how many different ways can you draw two letters from the alphabet? It's really important to um, know how many letters are in your alphabet. So this is your first letter, and this is your second letter. So this is your first letter, and this is your second letter. So the counting principle says that we multiply choices together. So how many letters are in the English alphabet? 26. 26. So for my first letter, I have 26 possibilities, and you have to really read the question. Did they mention anything about the fact that we could or could not repeat letters? Like, could I have an AA or a BB or a CC? It, it doesn't say I can't repeat, so if it doesn't mention that you cannot repeat, then assume that you can repeat. So I could have those values. 
So what would be my, uh, how many choices do I have for my second letter if I can repeat? 26. 26 again. What if I couldn't repeat? What would be my second choice? 25. And you'd multiply those together. So if you take your handy dandy calculator and multiply 26 times 26, you get 676 different possibilities. Look at example three. Now I know you all have cell phones now and you don't, I don't even know my own children's phone numbers because I just speed dial them. Um, but it says, how many different phone numbers can you get? You cannot use zero or one in the first position. Do they mention anything about an area code? We are in a time where we all have area codes. When I was your age, there was one area code in the Phoenix metropolitan area, and it was 602. It was very distressing when Scottsdale got 480. Because <laughs> all of a sudden, my number changed. I'm like, I've always been 602. I cannot be 480. It's very upsetting. Um, but now... There's 623, 602, 480, there's others, right? Plus you've got all the, you know, Payson, Prescott, all those. Um, so you're in the world of where we dial 1, the area code, and the number. Unless you're dialing a 480 to a 480, correct? Does this mention anything about an area code? Your assumption is no area code. So how many digits are there in a typical phone number? Seven. So we've got 1, 2, three, then there's a dash, that's not a minus sign, one, two, three, four, and we're going to multiply, and then this is still a multiplication here, that's a multiplication, and then we're multiplying here and here. There's a reason why we don't use zero or one in our first digit, because zero typically calls the operator, and one is typically what we put in front of an area code or for an international phone call. So your phones are dialed that way. Your grandparents, when they were kids, little bitty kids, they probably had letters and numbers on their telephone. Um, and they probably had four to six digits rather than seven. So their, their phone number might have been, you know, AZ1234. And so if you look at the old rotary phones, they all had letters above the numbers because they had to use letters and numbers. So let's see if we're going to run out of phone numbers. How many possibilities for the first digit? Well, how many one-digit numbers are there? Are there nine or are there ten? One through nine is nine, plus zero gives us ten. So there are ten digits. So how, Sam, how'd you get the eight? take away the zero and the one, and that's 10 minus two, that gives us eight possibilities for the first. And then how many for the second phone number digit? 10. Because they didn't say we couldn't repeat, right? I could have 999-9999. Uh, There's nothing that said I couldn't repeat. And so each of these become 10. And so you shouldn't even need a calculator to multiply this one together. So you end up with an eight and six zeros. There are 8 million different phone numbers. Are we going to run out of phone numbers? Ah, because that's for one area code, isn't it? And we have multitudes of area. Every area code has 8 million possible numbers. Do you think we're going to run out of phone numbers in your lifetime? Yes or no? No, <laughs> we are not. Um, if you did, what would they do? We'll add one digit. All they'd have to do is add one digit, and if I add one digit to this, now how many phone numbers do I have attached to one area code? 80 million. That's going to get us going for quite some time. By that time, you guys will have destroyed your planet. Not to worry. <laughs> okay, so, so sad. All right, so let's talk about the difference between a permutation and a combination. <coughs> How many of you have gotten those confused in the past and they're hard to remember? Oh, you're not even being honest. Thank you. Thank you for being honest. What is a permutation versus a combination? See, he knows it. So permutation 
order does matter. Notice that they, that they have written here ordering of the elements. Order matters. Well, how do you remember that? Let me tell you a little story. <laughs> it's a shocking story that might help you remember this. When I was really little, like elementary school little, my mom used to give me a Tony home permanent on my hair because I wanted curly hair. Now you girls have all these wonderful tools to make your curly hair straight and your straight hair curly. Well, we didn't have any of those. We had at best a curling iron that had a steam function on it, which I might add that when my mother used that on my hair, she'd burn my scalp. And she'd hit me with a hairbrush because I was crying. <laughs> I'm like, seriously, Mom, you burned my scalp. She just didn't like me whining. Isn't that mean? My mommy was mean. So my mom would, I know, she's sitting there going, I can't believe she hit you with a hairbrush. Yes, I got hit often with a hairbrush. Um, so you just think, if you think your parents are mean, my mother was meaner. So my mom would wet my hair. She would partition out my hair. Then she'd roll it really tightly in these little plastic curlers that were real skinny. She'd roll it so tightly it'd make my eyes water. Because, you know, the tighter the curl, the better the curl. And um, then she'd squirt this really nasty-smelling solution onto my hair, which would drip into my ears and drip into my eyes, and I'd have to hold a towel up, and I'd be complaining because it's getting into my ears and my eyes, and she'd just say, shut up. Like, but I don't like it. And you'd cover it with a towel. It was, And you'd have to sit there for... It was only supposed to be like 10 minutes, but my mom would have me sit there for 30 because my hair didn't curl. <laughs> Meanwhile, my hair is burning. Uh, my scalp is burning. And then finally she put on this um, product that would stop the other stuff from curling my hair. And then she'd take out the curlers and wash the hair and whatnot. And you'd have really curly poodle hair for about two weeks before it would last. So my question to you is this. If my mom reversed the order of that I just told you about my permanent, would she have curled my hair? So if she had put the product on to stop the curl first, then, well, she couldn't uncurl my hair, then curled my hair, then put the product on to curl it, then wet my hair, would it have worked? No, not at all, not in the least. Um, so my point is, you know, hair permanent, order matters. Permutations, hair permanent, order matters. So think of my mother hitting me with a hairbrush anytime I cried, while doing my hair, order matters. So your combination um, is on the other side of your paper. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, order doesn't matter on a combination. A couple other things. As you're going through this, they're not going to tell you it's a uh, permutation or a combination. So you kind of have to think. So let's say that um, 10 of you are running for Stugo. And there's only three positions available. And those three positions um, have no job associated with them. It's just three of you. I'm going to grab three of you out of the ten and put you on Stugo. Does order matter in um, who I state is on Stugo? So I have Stephanie and Megan and Cole. If I change the order of those three people, Cole, Stephanie, Megan, does order matter when I read out their names? No, because they don't have a special job. But now if I say that Cole was voted president, Stephanie vice president, Megan's secretary. But I say, oh, you know what? I've decided that I want Megan to be president and Cole, your vice president, and you get to be secretary. Is Cole going to be upset with that? He went from president, vice president, not so bad, but especially if I made him secretary, he'd be real mad about that, wouldn't he? Because he won. What if they're racing in a race and Cole came in first, Megan came in second, Stephanie came in third, but I said, oh, no, no, Megan, or Stephanie is getting the first place prize. Now, now Cole, are you upset? That's $100,000, Cole. Third place prize is only 1000 Are you upset? Yeah, order matters. So if we're in a race or a competition and there are place finishers, order matters. That's a permutation. If there's a specific job associated with the group of people that you're selecting out of a bigger group and each of them has a separate job, order matters. But if you're selecting that same number of people out of that group and they don't have specific separate jobs, order doesn't matter. That's a combination. So let's look at some different examples here. Example four, they actually tell you and they say how many permutations are possible. So they're kind of hinting that this is a permutation for the letters A, B, C, D, E, and F. In other words, I'm arranging, and so this is another type of um, example that could occur. You're arranging things on a shelf, or 
I'm arranging you in a line. If you're standing in line to receive, let's make it worth your while. You're standing in line to receive money. The first person in line receives $1,000. The second person, $800. The third person, $600. Fourth person, $400. And fifth person, $200. Does order matter? You're standing in line, does order matter? No. If you all got the same amount of money, would order matter? No. So typically when we arrange things in line, books on a shelf, CDs on a shelf, movies on a shelf, um, if I arrange people in a line, order matters if it's a permutation. So here we're arranging the letters. It's a permutation whether they told you that or not. So think of it this way. How many letters do I have? So I'm going to put six slots. I prefer to use the counting principle when I'm arranging and ordering things rather than the permutation formula that's on the back of this sheet. You can flip it to the back and look at that. We're going to do it this way, that way also in a minute, but I want to do the counting principle first. So I've got six different events, if you will. Each ordering of the letter is an event. And because I'm going to use a counting principle, I'm going to multiply <clears throat> those together. And so this is the first place, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth place. How many letters do I have available for first place? Six. And then don't I put one letter in first place? So how many letters are available for second place? Five. And then for third, four, three, two, and one. What do you know that that is? Six, five, four, three, two, one, multiply. What's that called? A factorial. Do you remember factorials? This is really six factorial. Remember that six with an exclamation point? That's six factorial. And it means you take that number and multiply it by one less number each time. And so go to your calculator. Press in six. Hit the math button, scroll over to probability, and you'll see a little explanation point there at number four, correct? So scroll down to number four, or just hit four, and then your calculator is going to read this six factorial and then hit enter. What do you get? 720 ways. So there are 720 different ways to order the letters A, B, C, D, and E and F. 720 ways. So this is using the counting principle. I prefer that method. It's typically easier to figure out. So, um, but we can look at the second page, and we're going to use the uh, permutation. So here we have this N and this R. And so you might want to circle the N or highlight the N and the R. And so the N right here is just your total, total, number of items available where the R is the number of items taken at a time. So in other words, if I have a total number of 10 things and I'm only grabbing three of them at a time, um, then your R would be three and your N would be 10. In our case here, we're going to go back to example four on the previous page. So in example four, how many total letters were there? Six. So your N would equal six. And then how many letters are rearranging out of those six? All of them or just a few of them? All of them. So in this particular case, your R is also six. And so if I'm going to use that formula, I've got P, and then to the left is your total, so P of six items taken six at a time is how that's read. And so that's going to equal, and I have N factorial, which is six factorial, divided by six minus six factorial. So doesn't that give me 6 factorial over 0 factorial? What does 0 factorial equal? It has a value of 1. 0 factorial and 1 factorial have the same value. Because 0 factorial means we're not writing anything down. 
and multiplying it to anything. What's always there as a factor when we're multiplying things? One, zero factorial. And, and if you think about it, well, if I get to an example, I'll show you longhand. Um, so we get 720, because we just did six factorial, 720 ways. So it's identical to what we did on the front of that page, just using that permutation formula. Um, I find that a little bit more confusing for some of you than just arranging them and using the factorial and the counting principle. So look at example five. We're going to do example five two different ways. It's one of my favorite types of examples is a race. So we've got way one that we can solve it versus way two. Way one, we're going to use a counting principle, and it says eight horses are running in a race. In how many different ways can these horses come in first, second, and third, and assume that there are no ties? So because there's only three place finishers, I'm going to have three um, blanks, if you will. And this is going to be for first place, this is going to be for second place, and this is going to be for third place. How many horses could possibly come in first place? Eight. Won't one of those horses win? So then how many horses could come in second? Seven. And how many in third? Six. So this is a partial factorial. You'll just stop right there. And you're going to multiply those out with your calculator. Eight times seven times six gives you 336 different um, ways to finish. Order matters um, in a race. We could do the same thing if you had five different hiking routes that you had a choice of, but you only have time in the day to do three hikes. Your first hike, you would have five possibilities. Your second hike, you would have four possibilities. Your third hike, you would have three possibilities. So, um, and, in, and technically in that case, order doesn't matter. Um, so wouldn't we have to use a combination? Because does it matter whether I do hike number one, hike number two, hike number three first? No, so because order matters when I'm doing something like that, I would not be able to just do five times four times three because I'd end up repeating certain things, and we'll talk about that in our last problem here in a minute. Um, look at way two, though. Way two, we're going to actually use the permutation formula. So we do have a permutation, order matters, and I have eight horses, so my n is eight. What's my r? I have three place finishers, so my r is three, because that's all I really care about. So I'm taking three horses at a time out of that eight to finish in first, second, and third, but order matters, so we're going to use this permutation. And so following the formula above, n factorial would be eight factorial divided by eight minus three factorial. which is 8 factorial over 5 factorial. Now, you could just put that in your calculator as is, but if you're not using your calculator, um, there's a couple of ways that you could do this. So we're going to stretch the 8 out. 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All divided by 5 factorial. 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Can't I cancel out this entire denominator with the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 up top? And aren't we left with the 8, 7, and the 6 being multiplied? Doesn't that give me 336 different ways just like way 1? So whether you use the permutation formula or this formula, it doesn't matter. Now, having said that, could I instead, here, instead of writing this 5 factorial, could I have instead just gone 8, 7, 6, and then just written all of this as just a 5 factorial, just 5 factorial, over 5 factorial? Couldn't I have written it as, instead of what I crossed out, couldn't I have written just 5 factorial here and just a 5 factorial here? 
only and then cross that out. So you can shorten up if you're doing this without a calculator. You can shorten that up by just taking whatever the biggest number in the denominator is here, and in this case, only had one number, and writing out the numerator's factorial to that factorial right there. So I would have just done 8, 7, 6, and then I would have stopped here and written 5 factorial, and then had 5 factorial in the denominator and just crossed them out. It's a lot less work. You don't have to stretch it all out. If you like to stretch it out, then you can. How about there's <coughs> a C? Like a who? Like 8C. Oh, this, the C is combination. And we're not using the combination here because order mattered. So we'll get to the combination here in just one minute. All right, so then, then we have this thing called distinguishable permutations. Distinguishable permutations. And it says, in how many distinguishable ways can the letters in banana be written? This looks very similar to example four, doesn't it? What's the difference between example four using A, B, C, D, E, and F and banana? Banana has letters that are repeating. So if I put all the A's together, all the N's together, and then the B, so if I had A, 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 N, N, B, and then I rearrange my A's only, wouldn't it still look the same? If I had A, 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 and I arranged them to A, 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 don't they look identical? So what this is asking is that how many ways can, you, can they be written so they are distinguishable? In other words, get rid of the ones that look identical. Even though technically order matters, in some of these things, they look identical to the other one. Whereas in example four, if you order A, B, C, D, E, and F, you will never have all 720 of those ways will look completely different from the others. Whereas in this one, we could still get 720 ways, but some of those look identical because of those repeated letters. So instead, we're going to use the following formula. You're going to use n factorial. Well, maybe I'll put that out a little bit further. So n factorial divided by n, and we're going to put down here n sub 1 factorial. times n sub 2 factorial times n sub 3 factorial times dot dot dot. That means that the pattern continues n sub 4, n sub 5, and so forth until you get to n sub k factorial. And what all of these n sub down here in the denominator means, these all represent the repeated numbers or the repeated letters. And so for every different letter in banana, we're going to represent that with an n sub number. Our n sub or our n factorial here still represents the total number of letters in banana. So over here to the right, n, well, we don't need to put the factorial, n is equal to, how many letters do we have? Six. So n is equal to six. We've got six letters. But n sub one, our first letter is b. And so how many b's do we have? just one. So n sub 1 is, is just 1. n sub 2, what's our next letter? Okay, so that's going to equal a. And how many a's do we have? We have three a's. So n sub 2 is going to be 3. Do we have any other letters? Okay, so n sub 3 is going to be represented by the letter n. And how many n's do we have? Two. Two. Are there any other letters? No. Nope, that's it. So when we write this out, our n sub 1 is 6, so we have 6 factorial. And then um, our n sub 1 is b, so we have one of those, so we have 1 factorial times our n sub 2 is a and we have three of those so we have three factorial 
times. And then our n sub 3 has a value of 2. So we have 2 factorial. So I'm going to show the shorthand here. Which of these in the denominator is the bigger number? The 1, 3, or the 2? The 3 is the bigger number. So I'm going to write 6 factorial out until I hit 3 factorial. So my 6 factorial becomes 6, 5, 4, and I'm just writing this as 3 factorial. I'm stopping at the 3. 6, 5, 4, 3 factorial. And then 1 factorial is 1. The 3 factorial I'm going to leave as 3 factorial because I'm going to completely cancel that with a 3 factorial above. The 2 factorial I'm going to write out as 2 times 1. I can start canceling. This 3 factorial cancels with that 3 factorial there. What can I cancel the 2 with? The 4 or the 6, but not both, just one or the other. So I choose to cancel it with the 4 twice. And that leaves me with, I have a 6, a 5, and a 2 left over to multiply. So 6 times 5 is 30. 30 times 2 is 60 distinguishable ways. So in example 4, we had um, 6 letters as well, but we had 720 ways. This time, with three A's and two N's repeating, we take that 720 ways and it gets pared down to just 60 dis distinguishable different ways to arrange those letters. So it cuts it down quite a bit. All right, so let's talk about combination. Combination order matters. Or order does not matter. Whoops, sorry. Order doesn't matter. It's quite the opposite of a lock combination, if you will. A order matters on a lock combination, but it's not so in a combination here. So think completely the opposite. Permutation, hair permanent order matters. Combination order doesn't matter. So look at the example that we're given. And, and what's the difference in this formula versus the permutation formula? What's the one thing that's different? You get this R factorial in the denominator, and what that's doing is it's taking away all of the doubled items. So in other words, if in our previous example, if I chose Cole, Megan, and Stephanie as members of Stugo, and they don't have distinguishable jobs amongst them, it doesn't matter what order I put them in. Stephanie, Cole, Megan, Megan, Cole, Stephanie, Cole, Megan, Stephanie, those are all the same combination. And so that R factorial in the denominator is getting rid of all of those extra combinations and only getting us to our distinguishable ones, the ones that are all completely different. Um, so a standard poker hand, and we're going to talk about what's in a deck of cards in a minute, but a standard poker hand consists of five cards dealt from a deck of 52. So here's my five cards. Does it matter what order those five cards are in? No makes no difference. I'm going to take a deck of 52 cards and select any five cards out of it at a time. Order does not matter in those five things that I'm selecting. And so that's why this is a combination and not a permutation. And so how many different poker hands are possible? Well, my N, how many total cards in a deck of cards? If you didn't know it was 52, they usually won't tell you that it's a deck of 52. They'll just say a deck of cards. You need to know that there's 52 cards in that deck. A lot of you kids these days do not play games with cards, so you have no idea what's in a deck of cards. It's sad. Really, it's sad. Makes me cry. Um, what do you think R is? Yeah, we're choosing five cards, so R, R is five. If I were choosing ten cards, my R would be ten. If I were choosing two cards, it'd be two. So we're going to use our combination of 52 items taken five at a time. And so that is equal to um, 52 factorial divided by oops, 52 minus five factorial and then an additional five factorial. So I get 52 factorial. What's uh, 52 minus 5? So we get 47 factorial 
times 5 factorial in the denominator. Now, if you were putting this into your calculator, you would make sure that that denominator has parentheses around the 47 factorial times the 5 factorial in order to get the proper answer. You should never get a decimal when you're doing permutations or combinations. However, we're going to do it out by hand. So if I'm going to list this out by hand, what is the bigger number in the denominator? So I'm going to stop 52 factorial at 47 factorial. And so I get 52, 51, 50, 49, 48, and I'm going to stop at 47 and put a factorial on the end. All divided by, and I'm going to keep 47 factorial as 47 factorial. But the 5 factorial I'm going to stretch out. 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Why did I do that? So I could do what? Cancel the 47 factorial with a 47 factorial. What can I cancel the 5 with? I, um, the only thing I can cancel with it with is the 50, and there should always be something that you can cancel with. You should never have anything left in the denominator. So the 5 goes in the 50 10 times. What about the 4? It can go into either the 52 or the 48. I'm going to put it into the 48. So I'm going to choose a different color. So we're going to do 4 into the 48 12 times. And then the 3 is going to go where? You can put the 3 into the 12 or the 51. Um, either way, it doesn't matter. I agree. I'm going to go into the 12 as well. So I'm going to cancel my 3 and put that into the 12 four times. And then what about the 2? Yeah, the 2 can go into the 4, it can go into the 10, it can go into the 52. Only one of them, though. And so, again, I'm going to choose the 2 to go into the 4 twice. And so I'm going to circle what I have left. I have the 52, the 51, the 10. Don't forget about the 49 and the 2. So multiply that out with your calculator. What do you get? So 960 different poker hands. Now, let's talk about what's in a deck of cards. So if you have no idea what's in a deck of cards, you're going to write the following down. Because I could ask you anything to deal with the suits, the colors, the face cards, the numbered cards in a deck of cards. And if you're unfamiliar with what those are, you need to write them down. So here we go. All right, so there are a total of um, 52 those cards are split into red and black suits. There are two black suits and there are two red suits. So there, if I split 52 in half, what do I get? 26. So I get 26 black and I get 26 red. And then the two black suits, you know what they're called? No. Spades, almost, and clubs. There are um, 13 spades and there are 13 clubs. And for math purposes, the ace of spades is not special. It is card number one. So there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king. Same thing with the clubs. And then for your red, they're split into two suits, hearts, which are thirteen, and diamonds. which is 13 also, one, two, three. Jack, queen, king. Jokers have no place in a deck of cards for math purposes.
Now, the other thing you need to be aware of is that these are all face cards. <clears throat> these are face cards. Face, face, face. The, the ace is not a face card, it's a numbered card. So that puts us at ten, twenty, thirty, forty numbered cards. Numbered cards. <coughs> and three times four is twelve face cards. So they could ask you probabilities out of, you know, uh, numbered cards, and that would be out of 40, versus face cards would be out of 12. Or a red face card, there are only six red face cards. Or there are only um, uh, 20 n black numbered cards. So you need to be aware of all those partitions. So if, you, if you're unaware of that, study that.